Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to see those of you who are present. I hope you've been blessed so far by what you've heard and learned. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will enlighten your understanding as he ministers to you through this message. Before I jump into the message, I must get something off my chest. Do I have your permission to do that? Last night, while our president, Justin McNeilis, was delivering his message, I was greatly distressed by all the walking around. People getting up, walking out, coming back in, sitting down, as though they were totally oblivious to the fact that they were conducting this behavior in the presence of a holy God who, in the Old Testament, if you read it, has killed people for disrespect. Now I'm asking you from my heart as your brother, this is holy ground. And when you find your seat, unless you have a medical necessity, please stay in your seat and listen carefully. Listen and not distract by constantly moving back and forth. I wrestled all night last night with God. Should I say this? But I feel I had to. Do you love me? Say yes. All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the life you've given to us today. You've given it to us to glorify your name in all that we do. Now, Lord, I particularly ask you to be merciful to me. Father, you know one of my favorite verses is Job chapter 40. Verse 4, Behold, I am vile, what shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Father, in my vileness and fallen condition, I ask you to be merciful and grant me the assistance of your Holy Spirit, that he may give to me the words to speak, the ideas to express, and the right spirit by which to do that. Please enlighten the understanding of your sons and daughters, I pray. And I thank you for answering this prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. I welcome you again and those of you listening at home by internet, however you're making contact with this service, may God bless you with an understanding of his word. The theme for this GYC is for this purpose. And it is based on Acts chapter 26, verses 16 and 18 to 18. But if you read from verse 15, the Bible says, and I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. The word purpose is of immeasurable significance in Scripture with respect to what God does with us and what God does in the universe. God is a God of purpose. And he told Paul, I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Let us look at a concept of purpose. In Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 14. And our subject for tonight, as in your bulletin, is a, a heavenly calling. But I've also given it another title, a line of distinction. So it has two titles, a heavenly calling and a line of of distinction Genesis 1 reading from verse 14 the Bible says and God said let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth in this detailing of the fourth day of creation we learn that God had a purpose for making the Sun the moon and the stars to divide the day from the night one purpose and for signs and for seasons and for days and years and for light upon the earth this is God investing purpose into his creation now God always begins first with a purpose then he brings something into existence to carry out that purpose that's the way God functions in Jeremiah chapter 1 reading from verse 4 the Bible says then the word of the Lord came unto thee, saying before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee 
and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctify thee, and I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. God had a purpose for Jeremiah before Jeremiah was born, before Jeremiah was conceived, before Jeremiah's father and mother to be met. God functions by certain principles and one of his principles is he always has a purpose. Every created thing, every created being, animate and inanimate, was created to fulfill a specific function. Ellen White writes in Christian Service, page 9, paragraph 3, a distinct work is assigned to every Christian. That's a purpose. It's a work. It's distinct. Manuscript releases, volume 14, page 205, paragraph 4. To each human being, God has assigned an individuality and a distinct work. What I am stressing is that we serve a God of purpose. If that is clear, somebody say amen. amen. God is a God of purpose. He is not a God of chaos. A situation does not arise and then God tries to determine how he will react. God always has a plan. This purpose is seen in the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. In John chapter 6, reading from verse 5 and verse 6, the Bible said, And Jesus said unto them, uh, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove them, for he himself knew what he would do. God always has a plan of action before a situation arises. You and I do not serve a disorganized God. For this purpose, God is a God of purpose. One of the most significant passages of all of the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Please go there with me as quick as you can. You're Seventh-day Adventist. You should find the books of the Bible with little difficulty. Somebody say amen. amen. Do you know that we are losing the ability to find the books of the Bible? We really are. I won't say why, but we are, and it's tragic because many years ago we used to be known as what? The people of the book yes now we are the people of the screen but it's okay Genesis chapter 12 reading from verse 1 do you have it now the Lord had said unto Abram get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee, finish it for me, shall all nations or families of the earth be blessed. Now in this final part of verse 3 of Genesis 12, God announces the purpose for his call to Abraham, and in thee. Shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's why God called Abraham. To be a blessing to the whole world. We are Abraham's seed. Galatians 3.29 If you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We are Abraham's seed consequently the purpose for which God called Abraham is precisely and without variation the purpose for which God calls us I have appeared unto you for this purpose and God has appeared to us as a gathering he has appeared to us as individuals for a specific purpose and that purpose has to do with warning the world of a coming destruction. That purpose has to do with alerting the world to the fact that there is a law that has always existed. It applies in heaven. It applies on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our purpose is to let the world know that God still requires that his law be obeyed, respected, upheld. I have appeared unto you for this purpose, says God. And when God gives a purpose to a man, 
or a purpose to a woman, he requires the carrying out of that purpose by the abilities and the talents, the strengths, the resources, the endowments that he gives to that person for the carrying out. Do you think God gave you the gift of singing so that you can win a Grammy? No, that's not why. God gave you the gift of singing that through the ministry of song you may touch hard hearts. You may minister to the love and the grace and the goodness of God. That gift is given that you might carry out the purpose for which God gave you life. For this purpose is our theme. A holy calling is one of our titles. A line of distinction is another title with respect to purpose as God gave it to Abraham and to us spiritually as children of Abraham observe what God told Abraham now the Lord had said unto Abram Genesis 12 1 get thee out of thy country get out and stay out leave separate yourself get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee unto a land that I will show thee God has a land where he wants you to exercise your talents in the fulfillment of his purpose. He will show you that land. That land need not be geographical. It may be a circumstance. But if God calls you, he will direct your steps unto a land that I will show thee. He continues, verse 2, and I will make of thee a great nation. Don't make yourself a great nation. I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee. And make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, which, by the way, is the same thing as Babylon. Is there a call in these last days to come out of Babylon? Are you familiar with it? That call goes all the way to Abraham. Ur of the Chaldees was Babylon. When Nebuchadnezzar erected that image on the plain of Dura, and required that all people, nations, and languages fall down and worship. And three ancient Seventh-day Adventist young men refused to bow. The Bible says that then drew near Chaldeans and accused the Jews. Chaldeans, Babylonians. And they told Nebuchadnezzar, these three boys would not bow. God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. Now, why did God do that? There is another principle by which God functions. We looked at the principle of purpose. Purpose, then existence. In other words, you are alive for a purpose. And if you don't fulfill that purpose, you have no right to live. You didn't like it. Come on Saturday night, I'll talk more about that. Let's look at another principle associated with purpose. God is a God who divides. He separates. He desires that certain things should not intermingle. Let us see that principle as early as we saw the principle of purpose. Let us go to Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 1, and I read from the King James Version. All those of you with Bibles, raise them, let me see quickly. We don't have much time. Raise them, let me see. This is not good enough. Makes me wonder why you came to GYC. Bring your Bibles tomorrow night. Well, not just tomorrow night. Bring them with you tomorrow morning to whatever session you choose to attend. Genesis 1, reading from verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God did what? Divided the light from the darkness. God did what? God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. 
and the evening and the morning were the first day we see God dividing separating severing one thing from the other it was not God's will when he created this world physically that light and darkness should coexist should commingle and intermingle and mix and by the way intermarry and so God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night one was clearly distinguishable from the other and God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the first day verse 6 Genesis 1 and God said let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so and God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the what the second day on the second day we have God exercising the principle of separation what is under what is above some things should not mingle and mix and have any form of fellowship or communion the principle i am stressing that walks hand in hand with the principle of purpose as the purpose was made clear to abraham is that in order to carry out this purpose i must first practice the principle of separation i must separate you from your country from your kindred from your father's house in order that you might carry out the purpose of being a light to every family of the earth let me tell you my brothers and sisters for you to carry out your purpose as a light bearer God desires that you separate yourself from every expression of darkness that includes friends somebody say amen That includes certain activities that on the surface look harmless and innocuous. But when closely examined, they are dangerous. That may include separation from family members. Let me say it again. With a reduced level of decibels, in order to carry out the purpose of being a blessing to all families of the earth Abraham had to be separated from the very people to whom he was to be a blessing because the blind cannot lead the blind many years ago there was a preacher in New York called Reverend Ike I hear the phone going off. It's my fault. I should have asked you, please turn off all cell phones now. Don't put them on vibrate. Just turn them off. Can you do that quickly? Then I'll get back to Reverend Ike. Turn them off. It's my fault. I should have asked you. Three favors. Turn off your phones. Pray for me while I speak and think. Those are the three. It's my fault. Turn them off, please. Are they all off? Don't put it on vibrate. Turn it off. You're in the presence of whom? God, the creator of heaven and earth, show him some respect. Back to Reverend Ike in New York in the 70s. He had a saying, the best thing you can do for the poor is not to be one of them. Now, when you examine that statement, it sounds cold and harsh. But there is profundity in that statement because the poor really can't help the poor. That's why the blind cannot leave the blind. The best thing you can do for the blind is not be blind. And the best thing you can do for a world perishing is sin is not to participate in the sin. Do you understand the biblical reasoning? And so God said, Abraham, in order that you might be a blessing to them, I've got to remove you from them. 
But for some reason unknown to me, many of us believe that to be a blessing to those who need Christ, we ought to be like them, dress like them, talk like them, play like them, do everything under the sun like them. It is contrary to the biblical principle of separation. What did Jesus say? John 8, 23. Hear from a belief, I am from above. Hear of this world, I am not of this world. Now when he said that, he was standing on terra firma. He was standing on the earth. He was within touching distance of them. But in his thinking, his moral structure, the principles that guided his life were of a heavenly origin. In that sense, he was not from beneath. He was from above and so he told Pilate in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. Because that's how the world settles problems. They fight. They march with placards and they shout and they break windows and burn cars. Jesus Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world and no worldly thinking systems, no secular th systems of thought should be used to make plans for my work because my kingdom is not of this world and I have called you for a work that requires first that you be separated, come out. Give up that non-Adventist boyfriend. And girlfriend. If you're already married, keep the person. <laughs> now, I'm not joking. I'll make an appeal at the end of the service for precisely that point. One of the reasons God allowed the Israelites to go into Egypt is to keep them from intermarriage which had begun to happen. When you hear in Genesis 1, and God divided the light from the darkness, you can almost hear the spiritual principle in 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And or what communion hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what fellowship hath light with darkness? There should be no interaction. When light and darkness mix, they both become darkness. Did you hear me? When light and darkness mix, they both become darkness. That is why God instructed the Israelites coming out of Egypt across the wilderness, do not mingle with the surrounding nations, for if you do, they will turn your heart from me. He never said mingle and turn their hearts to me. They will turn your hearts from me. They will turn your light into darkness. And if the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? My brothers and sisters, the principle of purpose must go hand in hand with the principle of separation. An Egyptianized Israelite is useless to God. What does Ella White have to say? <clears throat> Before I tell you what she has to say, let me tell you who she is. For those of you who are saying this is entirely unnecessary, you're wrong. Even in an Adventist gathering, it is necessary to give some rudimentary, basic, foundational, and fundamental information about Ellen White. Because she has been the target of unceasing attacks, which is nothing more than a fulfillment of prophecy, which then certifies and which supports her validity as a genuine prophet. Because she said it would happen. So when you attack her, you're fulfilling prophecy. Thank you for that. Last day events, page 45, paragraph 1, Ellen White writes, The Lord has made us the depositories of his law. For this purpose have I appeared unto thee. One of the purposes, we are the depositories of God's law as verily as the Israelites were the depositories of the oracles of God. Thousands of years ago, the Lord has made us the depositories of his law. We have it. Not to admire it as admiring an artwork in a museum, but to let the world know there is a law that has to be kept, for it is the standard in the judgment. Amen. 
The devil has gotten into ministers to stand in pulpits and preach. There is no law. You're under grace. There's no law. God has a people who will say, no, no, no. There is a law. Somebody, come on, say amen. There is a law. And if you live contrary to that law, you're lost. Certainly, you keep that law through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Only a converted man or woman can keep God's law because it's a spiritual law and spiritual things are spiritually discerned. It is the converted heart that can keep that law. It is the same law angels keep. And so Ellen White says, the Lord has made us the depositories of his law. He has committed to us sacred and eternal truth which are to be given to others in faithful warnings, reproofs, and encouragement. That's one reason this church was raised up. Last day events, page 45, paragraph 2. Seven day Adventists have been chosen by God as a peculiar people separate from the world. I got a few amens from the front pew, any amens from the back. Let me say it again. Seventh-day Adventists have been chosen by God. By whom? By God. As a peculiar people separate from the world. Which means, and I don't care about being politically correct. I don't care at all. I couldn't care less. She is saying that God has split the world into two. Us. And them. Us and them. In the Old Testament and part of the New, the world was split into two. Israel and them. When Jesus comes, he will take some home and he will destroy the others. Us, we're going home. The rest are them. But the Lord is not willing that any should perish, so he uses us to appeal to them. But to do that effectively, you can't be one of them. Why is that so hard to understand? You cannot be one of them and benefit them. And so Seventh-day Adventists have been chosen by God as a peculiar people separate from the world. By the great cleaver of truth, he has cut them out from the quarry of the world and brought them into connection with himself. Tomorrow night, I will discuss the cleaver of truth. Ah, the cleaver of truth. He has made them his representatives and called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. The most, the greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals. Now how far back do mortals go on this earth? Adam and Eve. Listen again. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals. The most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to man have been committed to them to be given to the world. Them. That's been us this time. The most solemn and fearful warnings. And what am I doing? Spending time in the world. Trying to be like Little Wayne and uh, Paris Hilton. Jesus died for them. Trying to be like someone who, when person isn't drunk, the person is high. And that's what God's young people find attractive when there is a work of life saving. The most solemn and fearful warning ever sent by God to man has been given to them, committed to them, I should say, to be given to the world. Testimonies, volume 5, page 455, paragraph 2. God has called his church in this day as he called ancient Israel. Did you get the as he? God has called his church in this day as he called ancient Israel to stand as a light in the earth. Why should they stand as a light in the earth? Because the earth is in darkness. There goes the makeup. To stand as a light in the earth. By the mighty cleaver of truth. He has separated them 
from the churches. There's a movement in the Adventist church among young people, well, perhaps not in North America, but wherever I go overseas. They go to church on Sabbath, properly, biblically, but they go to other churches on Sunday to find the Spirit. Because they associate the Spirit with noise and cymbals and drums. I'm telling you what I've come across. And when they persist in that behavior, very soon they come back with arguments defending Sunday sacredness. By the mighty cleaver of truth, he has separated them from the churches and from the world to bring them into a sacred nearness to himself. A nearness to God necessarily implies a separation from something else. My brothers and sisters, why I have appeared unto you for this purpose. We are to be a light in a dark world. We are to be those who defend and uphold the mighty, sacred, righteous, truthful law of God. The law which was the center of the controversy way back when God was accused of having a law that cannot be kept. You have been called to let the universe see Satan was wrong. God's law can be kept. Somebody say amen. And you and I must show the world this law can be kept. And must be kept. Evangelism, page 233, paragraph 2. He has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin. You don't know who the man of sin is. Go study Revelation again. And Daniel. And Second Thessalonians. Listen to me. He has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin. Now, how can you expose the wickedness of the man of sin when you're picnicking with the man of sin? Signs of the Times, February 19, 1894, paragraph 4, Ellen White writes, It is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. A backsliding church, one of the signs of a backsliding church is that it is becoming friendly with the man of sin. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to expose the man of sin. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to be a light in the earth. For I have appeared to thee for this purpose to be a blessing to all families of the earth. For that to happen, you and I must come out. A line of distinction. We are such a special people in God's sight that even our name received his stamp of approval. What's our name? Is that all the energy you have? What is our name? Seventh all Seventh-day Adventists say amen. Do you know we have a lot of Seventh-day Baptists in the Seventh-day Adventist church? <laughs> we have a lot of Seventh-day Adventist Pentecostals. We have a lot of Seventh-day Adventist Buddhists. And God bless them all. We have a lot of Seventh-day Adventist Hindus. And tomorrow night I'll explain why. But Ellen White writes in Testimonies, Volume 1, page 223, paragraph 1, I was shown in regard to the remnant people of God choosing a name. Now, I was shown, not I heard, or someone told me, or I read it in the Enquirer. I was shown. By whom? God. The remnant people of God taking a name. Two classes were presented before me. Listen carefully. One class embraced the great uh, numbers or hosts of professed believers, professed Christians, you see. They were trampling upon God's law. 
and bowing to a papal institution. They were keeping the first day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord. The other class who were but few in number were bowing to the great lawgiver. They were keeping the fourth commandment. The peculiar and prominent features of their faith were the observance of the seventh day and waiting for the appearing of our Lord from heaven. Ellen White saw two classes. What she's saying is our name must cause a distinction. The very name is a sermon. And she was shown two classes. Testimonies, volume 1, page 223, paragraph 3. No name which we can take will be appropriate but that which expresses our faith, accords with our faith, and expresses our uniqueness and marks us as a peculiar people. Peculiar. The name Seventh-day Adventist is a standing rebuke to the Protestant world. Amen. You didn't hear me. Or you're tired from all the workshops you attended. Or you're sleepy or you're stunned. The name Seventh-day Adventist is a standing rebuke to the Protestant world. Here is the line of distinction. I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to draw a line in the sand. All in favor of God, come to this side. All in favor of obedience through faith in Christ, come to this side. All who believe in righteousness by faith, come to this side. All who believe in conquering all sin in this world through Christ, come to this side. Here is the line of distinction between the worshipers of God and those who worship the beast and receive his image. The name. You have been called to carry a name that God approved. And when you do not understand that, along with all the other reasons for which God called you and me, then you are simply someone who does not work on Saturday. You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. Testimonies, Volume 1, page 224, Paragraph 1. Ellen White writes, The name Seventh-day Adventist carries the true features of our faith in front and will rebuke the inquiring mind. Like an arrow from the Lord's quiver, it will wound the transgressors of God's law and will lead to repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to me, she says, the very name convicts. Medical ministry, page 49, paragraph 4. Christ was a Seventh-day Adventist to all intents and purposes. Somebody say something. Amen. Christ was a Seventh-day Adventist to all intents and purposes. That's what the prophet says. To all intents and purposes mean by his ministry, his teaching, his lifestyle. He, he represented what the ideal Adventist should be. The, the word ideal is indispensable. Ah, Christ was a Seventh-day Adventist to all intents and purposes. Do you understand what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist? When you don't, you seek other, identi other identities. You see, all people want to identify with something. When you do not understand the close identity of this church with God, then you seek other identities. And if it's not in God, it has to be in the world. There are only two sources. For this purpose, a line of distinction. My brothers and sisters, God is a God of purpose. He has called you to be a light to the world. In a very special sense, last day events, page 45, paragraph 3. In a very special sense, seven-day Adventists have been placed in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them have been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. If someone fell on the ground and started foaming at the mouth, would you not do something? Yes. The world is foaming at the mouth. 
And God has given to us the means of spiritual resuscitation if they will accept it. But we decide to form at the mouth with them. Separation goes hand in hand with the fulfillment of purpose. How many of you have understood the gist of what I've been trying to say tonight? Raise your hand quickly. Ah, God bless you. From my heart, God bless you. Well, I want you to make a decision. Take action. Show courage. This is generation of youthful Christ, not generation of youthful cowards. I want you to show some courage. How many of you will say, Lord, this message has opened my eyes. I did not realize what it meant to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And Father, help me not only to live by the principle of purpose, but by the principle of separation that I might carry out that purpose. Help me, dear God, like my father Abraham, to come out that I might be a blessing to others. How many of you will say that with me? Well, may I see your right hand? I want you to stand. I want you to rise to your feet. Separation means how I dress, how I eat, how I spend my money, my romantic associations. You and I must come out separate that the divine purpose entrusted to us might be carried out in its purity and with its highest level of efficacy that requires separation Jesus prayed I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil separation from the evil of this world the thinking of the world the principles of the world come out and think like God see everything through God's eyes that's what I'm asking for for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to be different not for the sake of difference but let me repeat for the sake of the fulfillment of purpose let me tell you again clearly Without separation from the world, you and I cannot be a blessing to the world. And as God called our father Abraham, he calls us. Now I have a very strict call to make, very, very serious, very tough. I know some of you will respond. <laughs> One of the things that are plaguing this church is this widespread epidemic of Seventh-day Adventist young people with non-Adventist romantic partners. And that has to stop. Now listen to me. If in the spirit of separation, if you are in a relationship with a non-Adventist and you're not married, I want you to make a decision now to break it off. And I want you to come and make that commitment right here. Come. <clears throat> come. If you are in a relationship with a non Seventh day Adventist, break it off. Come. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. The process of separation has to begin somewhere. If you're dating and not, break it off. Not because the person is demonic, the person is not of our faith. And an unbeliever is someone who does not believe present truth. Not someone who doesn't go to church, someone who does not believe present truth. In the spirit of come out, break it off, come. Someone else come. Now you're coming to tell God, Father, I have decided. When you get back to your room and you call that man or woman, you're not calling to discuss anything. You're calling to announce that the Spirit of God has touched your heart and you are announcing a dissolution, a termination of a relationship that was offensive in the eyes of God. Somebody say amen. amen. 
someone else come come on don't be cowards don't hide come come brother break it off now ladies men have a gift for turning your heads around but Jesus can keep your head straight make the commitment in your heart you're breaking it off listen to me I don't care what he says and I don't care how much his heart is broken I am too busy being concerned about how much God's heart is broken so I don't care if his heart is broken or hers stop breaking God's heart somebody else come you are romantically involved with someone not of this faith. The Bible is against it. The church is against it. Ellen White is squarely against it. Everything is against you. Break it off. And apologize to the person for giving the person the impression that the church stands for that kind of thing. The church does not tolerate it. Somebody else come. Young people, separate yourselves in order that you might fulfill God's mission. Who else is involved illegally? Come. This is very serious. You ought to be praying. I am sick to death of counseling women, almost always women, who are crying because the husband is making their lives a living hell. Why would an Adventist husband do that? He's not an Adventist. Oh, really? Did you know that before you married him? Yes. What do you want me to pray about? Who else will come? Don't get the impression I'm unfeeling. I'm very sympathetic, but I have to be blunt. Who else is involved with a relationship God cannot bless? Come. I have four minutes and two seconds. Someone else come. I know you're there. I know that. Someone else, come, break it off, break it off. God never and cannot and will not bless disobedience. Can't do it. It is not a form of evangelism you find in scripture. Someone else, come. Separation, separation. Some of you are reading books you should not be reading. What goes into the mind determines the quality of the mind. You're reading books that you should not read. They're useless. They damage you spiritually. And you need to stop. If this is your problem, come. Say, so Lord, I will give up these books, these novels I've been reading that damage me spiritually. I need to stop and pour your word and the writings of Ellen White into my mind. If that is your situation, come. Put away those books. Come. Make a commitment to God. Those novels. Most romance novels are read by women. Come. Come, sister. Come. Separation. In order to be effective in doing God's work. Separation. There are things I'm reading I shouldn't read. Come. Put a smile on God's face for once. Ease his agony his pain, his suffering. Another call. Father, I've been visiting websites I should not visit and I want to stop by your grace. Come. Come. Whether the website is on your computer or your iPhone or your U-phone or your Wii phone, come. Just come. I need to stop going to those sites. The devil has a million ways to attract our attention. Let's cut them off one by one. Come. I go to sites I should not visit. I've got one minute, 42 seconds. Come quickly. Come run if necessary. I go to sites I should not visit. I pay good money to go to professional basketball games. Uh, and I waste God's money. I need to stop and use the money to support the church build some churches somewhere in the third world not give money to professional athletes who make millions I need to stop misusing God's money come leave the thinking of the world alone leave it alone come 
Every head bowed, come, come, come. I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. God requires purity. Purity necessitates separation. Come quickly, come quickly. Every head bowed, every eye closed. As I pray, dear God, dear God in heaven, if I have been too blunt, too harsh, too hard, too unfeeling, Father, that was not my intention. But I pray that God, you'll take this message, my human effort, and you polish it up, fix it up, and apply it to every listening heart with the convicting presence of the Holy Spirit. Father, we must separate from the world and live out the mission you've given to us and to fulfill the purpose you have graciously given to us. It is a privilege to receive a purpose from God. And so, Father, I pray for those who have come in answer to difficult calls. Give them victory, dear God, particularly those who have to make calls, breaking off illicit relationships that you frown upon and cannot bless. Give them the